Okay. Hi, Nan. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So is it, you're, you live, sorry, you live a few blocks from Art. Is that right, Art Dempster? Well, it's more than a few blocks. Walking distance, though. You see each other pretty often. That's me. Well, we see each other, mm, try and see each other a couple of times a month, or but it's probably less than that. So, so we're, as you know, we're here to talk about your 1982 paper with Jim Ware. Yes. You want to see? Yeah. yeah. So that, so that's a, that's a paper I know quite um, well, uh, man. When I first came to Stanford, um, I, I worked in biostatistics my whole career here. Yeah. And sure enough, um, doing biostat consulting, um, random effects and repeated measures came up over and over again. And my collaborators um, wanted me to, to fit mixed effects models. And so I had, to, I had to learn up mixed effects models. And so I read your paper then. And it, it explained the different approaches to mixed effects models really beautifully. And I've always used it, used it as a reference, as have many other people as well. Is, is that one of the papers you're most proud of? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. you want to tell us a bit how it came about? Yes. Um, it's very much a collaboration between Jim Weir and myself. We were both faculty at the School of Public Health, but we got there with very different uh, perspectives, very different roots. I had completed my uh, graduate work at Harvard Statistics in 1975 and went directly to the School of Public Health. There was no such thing as postdocs. And, and I was still doing, really interested in doing methods work and random effects and kind of extensions of the EM algorithm. And um, I, I honestly, I kind of floundered in, in how to become a more applied statistician. I never kind of got any traction with any real projects there. So I didn't quite know what I was supposed to be doing most of the time. And then Jim Ware was sort of totally different. He came from Stanford, but he went first to the NIH and he worked there with a lot of applied statisticians. Sounds somewhat like what you just said, Trevor. And, and so he was used to prob people bringing him all of these problems of how to handle mixed effects, random effects, what to do with unbalanced data, missing data, uh, and and he, his idea was that with my experience and my interest in random effects and variance components that, and his interest in applied problems, we ought to be able to figure out how to, to develop a method that would be friendly to applied statisticians that would enable them to solve some of these problems. And, and I should mention that before that time, the sort of growth curve literature that was very popular was absolutely useless to the applied statisticians. They, they required all of these models involving chronic or products and matrices of, of regression coefficients, and they required every subject be measured at exactly the same set of times and no missing data, no dropouts. So those were very hard to implement in, in, in practice. So Jim Ware, oh, the other thing I should mention, Jim was working on a very high profile um, study known as the Harvard study of the health effects of air pollution, or it's oh, right. more fondly known as the Harvard Six City Study. And it was being carried out in the environmental um, health department. And it was a, a long running study trying to discern whether or not um, children, especially, uh, whether or not the growth in lung function in children was impaired by living in high, more highly polluted cities. So they followed sets of children in multiple different cities. So it's known as the Harvard Six City Study. 
for that reason. And so he and I got together and just set out to develop a method that applied statisticians could use. And I think it incorporated ideas from lots of different uh, places. I think that's what's so appealing about the paper because I'd seen I'd seen work at one of my the places I'd worked at previously on variance component models. Yes. And that was a little opaque, and that was basically the marginal maximum likelihood approach. Yes. And, and that was, you know, for me, that was a little bit hard to get into. But the approach that you present in, in your paper, um, using empirical Bayes and the Bayesian approach where you can think of estimating the random effects and the fixed effects yes. and they all work together. Um, you know, th that just made it much more transparent for me. And uh, I've used it, you know, I've used it ever since and it's come up over and over again, you know, also in developing new models and, and, and things like that. I just find the approach very appealing. I just a, a, a little aside, P Peter Bickle told me that he got his job at Berkeley over the phone. Like he didn't even have <laughs> You started School of Public Health, and where did you, you graduate from? At Harvard. Statistics so, Department. Of Art was my thesis advisor. No, so of course he's. So I guess I'm asking, was there a job interview, or just you just said, "Come on on." Oh no, there was a job interview because the interview was at the School of Public Health. Okay. And um, no, they had. Yeah, that was and, at. And the, who's your advisor at Harvard? The art. Our exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, the other thing in that paper is a contrast between maximum likelihood and restricted maximum likelihood. Oh, yes. I, I admit. <laughs> yeah. And that, that seems to be important, especially when you've, you're estimating many random effects and you've got many components of variance. Yes. Yes, I think, I think you're right. It is important. Yeah. It's uh, and I note, I, I've noticed that... Um, that distinction, uh, that's an option. For example, Rob and I use use R for computing yeah. a lot. And as you know, there's, there's packages in R, NLME and LME that, that fit your models. And oh. they always give the option for, for Raymond or maximum likelihood. And yeah. so those choices have been available ever since. How, how, was the, how was the paper received by referees and by the public? So I, you know, I, I remember nothing about referees, to be honest. They were pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Trevor is telling you how it was received by the public. I, I think it was sort of like getting the first olive out of the jar. And uh, it, 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 we all knew there was this jar of olives in there, but getting the first one out was really difficult. And I, and there, there was a lot of follow-up work that ensued that um, was very complimentary, I think, to the work that we did. What we did, uh, well, I think one of the things that was really important about what we did was use ordinary regression models for uh, the expected value of the response, because not everybody really understood how that was going to work. And I think just using ordinary regression models is always a good thing to do if you can, because people are so familiar with them, and at least they feel like they know how to interpret them. Um, so that was one thing we did. And then we allowed arbitrary patterns of measurements over time, arbitrary numbers measurements um, and we showed people how to do the estimation and we showed them how they could it could be done by uh, maximum likelihood using or Rimmel using the EM. So I think it gave people a lot of what was wanted and needed at the time, but there was a, a, not, you know, a lot that wasn't there. I mean, an immediate and obvious thing was how to extend this to generalized linear models. And that's what I feel um, uh, kind of motivated the work by Scott Seeger and Kung Liang on the generalized estimating equation. And I remember that um, 
while he he and Scott were working on the paper, Kung Yi came to visit Harvard for several months. I don't remember exactly what time. We, uh, Jim and I had, had established a kind of a working group on a analysis of longitudinal data. And he came and talked to us as, about his work in progress. And I think, you know, there were several things that he did that fixed some of the criticisms of our work, the generalized uh, regression models for the mean, and also the parametric approach. Their work didn't require any, make any assumptions about the model for the distribution of responses, which is of course good and bad. Um, and then they had an approach that uh, separated out the use of a kind of a working assumption for what the structure of the variance covariance matrix looks like. And um, so I thought it, it's a good complementary approach. Of course, their approach was not uh, is not an invariant to any patterns of missing data, except the sort of simplest missing completely at random. You, and then there, just go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, we're going to talk to Scott later this week. We're going to talk to Scott. <laughs> oh, okay. We'll hear from his point of view, and then uh, you know, I think another important paper that that in this case came directly, I think, out of the working group uh, because the three the three people were members is Jamie Robbins, Andrea Rutnitsky, and Lu Ping Zhao. I don't know if you're going to discuss their paper. Their paper, their paper also, they were very interested in relaxing the assumption of multivariate normality, um, but they were also very concerned about the probability of dropout that might be related to past history of individuals. So they developed a really nice approach to of, um, inversely weighted estimating equations. Yeah. Uh, Jim Weir spent his whole career at NIH, is that right? No, no. Or, or he went to School of Public Health in the late 70s. Oh, okay. I came in 75, he probably came around 78. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. And yeah. he, he died a number of years ago, is that right? Oh, yes, he died quite early um, before he retired. He had cancer. Okay. So now we have, we've also got um, there's methods for doing generalized linear mixed models. And um, you have it at Harvard uh, bias that Jihan Lin, who did That's the right. on that with uh, yes. Bidler, right? How is that different? Oh, I see. It's a different approach. Well, yeah. I think. I don't know for sure, but I think her work was mainly on variance components, so rather than where you actually had repeated measures and needed to model variance covariance. Oh, I thought, I, yeah, okay. I've been well, wrong about that. I thought she, um, I thought she had like generalized uh, mixed like logistic regression models and 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 such like where you had random effects. Um, I think you're right. I think yeah. she did have random effects, but I don't think, and I think it led to sequence of variance components. Mm -hmm. So one paper you didn't mention, but was I quite prominent prior to ours was David Harville's. Yes. And the, so his work was very similar, but again, he only did variance components. Well, he did yeah. I, mean, I meant to mention it because what the thing I liked about your paper, because there was quite a lot of prior work, right? There was Robinson yes. as well. You know, there was literature all over the place. And yes. there was a lot of literature around balanced designs and balancing yes. overs with mixed effects. Such literature. Your, I think your paper brought together all these techniques in one place and gave and gave us one thing to read and understand these models from many different points of view. So, so which I think is why it's got it's had over 11,000 citations in Google. Oh, okay. so really one thing I take away from this conversation is two, one thing is it's important to write papers that are try to be as simple as possible and clear and connect things. Mm -hmm. The other one is it's, it's important, and I believe in this strongly, to work on applications. Like you said, when you when you, when you met Jim Ware, that he brought in the applied part and that motivated, yes. right? And that's so I important. That's right. 
he he understood what it was like to be an applied statistician struggling with these issues and my credit for that part of it my supervisor brad efron told me he, he in his early part of the career he would sit in his office and just try to dream up problems to work on he said with some success and then he, he started doing consulting and realized that's the way to get problems talk to the, the people right. the scientists who need who have needs that's now, right yeah. yeah now of course things have exploded we've got much more computing power they the, the mixed models have got more complicated they've got hierarchical models and the software you know has extended all these things are you working on random effects that handles hundreds of thousands of yeah i worked on a project recently yeah with with a a, a cross a cross design unbalanced cross design with yeah. with thousands of of individuals each with a random effect yes and, um actually hundreds of thousands of individuals and tens of thousands of products oh okay and, yeah and we were using we were using the same techniques oh um, good the same framework as, as yeah. that's in your paper and some of the identities became really useful and we had to come up with computational tricks to to be able to fit these things it's a, it's a backfitting algorithm isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah we used um, yeah we used backfitting and and block coordinate descent and all kinds of tricks yeah. but okay. uh, so yeah so these things i mean with computers today we can fit much more complex higher dimensional versions of these models yeah. But one yeah. thing I've noticed is that uh, you know these days we have machine learning and AI and they, you know and they use neural networks and things like that and the repeated measures are there and they don't really have good ways of taking it into account. Yeah, so that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's still work to be done. I think the repeated measures design is incredibly common. Yeah. Incredibly common. Yeah. Yeah. But so interesting, though, that the really earliest literature, the 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 big idea was people kind of accepted that it was too difficult to estimate the variance components in the complete model and weight inversely according to variance components. And so what people did instead was a lot of the attention in these previous papers was how do you analyze the data using least squares and so that you lose the least amount of information? And that, that's what a lot of classical design is all about. The incomplete block design is how to use least squares and design your study so you lose the least amount of information. But this method actually enables you to recapture it if you want. Well, Ned, it's, it's been really fun talking with you. And uh, as a student, so, uh, Rob's running this uh, literature uh, class, and your paper is one of the papers. And uh, so it'll come to life again in that class. And, That's great. Uh, and they'll be able to watch this video, video and, and get some background uh, information. So we're going to stop the video in a second. Could you hang in there? Because I have another question for sure. you. But thank you very much, Ben. That was really okay. great. Thank you.